Así me gusta. Creo que todos estamos aquí para ver al, doc al infamo doctor Kaku. No, no infamo, famosísimo. Es co-creador de la teoría de cuerdas. Ha escrito varios libros sobre la física. Su último es La física de lo imposible. Ha llegado al sexto lugar en el New York Times Bestsellers List. Y recientemente fue votado por, no, escogido por la revista New York Magazine como uno de los 100 de las 100 personas más inteligentes de Nueva York. Entonces ya es oficial. Por favor, una ronda de aplausos para el doctor Kaku. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. <laughs> Let me say I have a confession to make. New York Magazine voted me as one of the 100 smartest people in New York. But I have a confession to make. You see, in all fairness, I have to admit that Madonna also made that same list. <laughs> So how authoritative can that list be? Now, I'm a physicist. We invented the laser. We invented the transistor. We created the computer. We wrote the World Wide Web. We created the satellite, the space program, the GPS, MRI, x-rays. We created television. We created radio. And now we are creating the next 20, 50, the next 100 years. We physicists love to make predictions. We can predict the universe out to billions of years. Let me quote from that great philosopher of the Western world, Woody Allen. <laughs> Woody Allen once said, quote, eternity is an awful long time, especially toward the end. <laughs> Let me quote from that other great philosopher of the Western world, the baseball player Yogi Berra. <laughs> He once said, quote, prediction is awfully hard to do, especially if it's about the future. <laughs> well, today, I'm going to predict the future. I've interviewed over 300 of the world's top scientists to give you the best prediction of the future. Now, sometimes we physicists can make a mistake. When we physicists created the internet, one physicist made a prediction. He predicted that the internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. Today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. <laughs> But that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas get on the internet. Then 50% of the internet will be pornography. <laughs> okay? And before I begin, let me tell you a short story of what happened over 200 years ago in Paris, France. There was the great French Revolution. And one day, there were three gentlemen about to have their heads cut off at the guillotine. There was a priest, a lawyer, and a theoretical physicist, just like me, about to have their heads chopped off. Well, they asked the priest, Do you have any last words before we cut your neck? And the priest said, yes. He said, God, God from above shall set me free. Well, all eyes were on the blade. They raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and it stopped right before it hit the neck of the priest. Well, the mob had never seen this before. And so the mob said, let him go. God has spoken today. And now let's see about the lawyer. Well, they put the lawyer's head on the chopping block and they asked him, do you have any last words before we cut your head off? 
And the lawyer said yes. He said the spirit of justice. Justice shall set me free. Well, they raised the blade. The blade came down, swish, and stopped right before it hit the neck of the lawyer. Well, this time, there was dancing in the streets of Paris. People were saying, God has spoken. Justice has spoken today. And now let's see about the physicist. Well, they put the physicist's head on the chopping block. And they asked him, do you have any last words before we cut your head off? And the physicist said, yeah, yeah, I got some last words. And he said, you know, I don't know too much about God. And I know even less about the law. But I do know one thing. If you look up, you'll see that the rope is stuck on the pulley. <laughs> and then he said, if you remove the rope, the blade should come down real good. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> Big mistake. The rope came down, the blade came down, and the poor physicist's head came down. And the lesson is, sometimes we physicists have to know when to keep our mouths shut. <laughs> but nonetheless, let me now Let me now talk about the future. My last book was Physics of the Impossible, Starships, Warp Drive, Antimatter Engines, Time Travel, all of that, now a TV series on the Science Channel. Have you seen the program Sci-Fi Science on the Science Channel? A few of you have, right? It's on the Science Channel, my book, is now a TV series on the Science Channel, Physics of the Impossible. So let's begin a discussion of the future. Some people say, how can you predict the future when nobody predicted the crash of 2008? How good are your predictions? Well, let me tell you this. Science is the engine of prosperity. Science is the origin of wealth. But science comes in waves. Therefore, wealth also comes in waves. So the first wave of science was the steam engine. In the 1800s, the steam power engine gave us the locomotive. The locomotive gave us wealth, fantastic wealth. The wealth of the Industrial Revolution. Factories locomotives, steam power, engines, and that fabulous wealth had to go someplace. And where did that wealth go? The London Stock Exchange. All that wealth created a bubble, a huge bubble that popped in 1850. That was the first great crisis of capitalism, the crash of 1850 created because science created the steam engine, which created wealth, which went to the London Stock Exchange, creating a bubble which popped. This is the origin of Marxism. Karl Marx wrote against capitalism because of the crash of 1850. But time marches on. The next great invention was electricity the gasoline-fired car, the automobile. That created fantastic wealth of the 1920s. Where did that wealth from science go? It went to Wall Street. Utility stocks, electric stocks, automobile stocks created a huge bubble on the American Stock Exchange. And what happened? It collapsed in 1929. The crash of 1929 was created because of the wealth of science went into the American Stock Exchange, creating a bubble. Now you would think we would learn a lesson. No. What happened recently? The wealth of the last several decades 
was the wealth of high technology. Lasers, internet, transistors, computers, GPS, space program. And where did that wealth go? Into real estate. And when did it pop? Three years ago. If this is correct, then roughly every 80 years, science creates a wave which creates wealth. Wealth creates a bubble which pops. So your grandchildren may experience the crash of 2090. That could be the next great crash of capitalism. So then the big question is, the question that I will ask today is, if the first wave was steam power, the second wave was electricity, the third wave was computers and high technology, what is the fourth wave? This is the biggest question facing science today. Steam power, electricity, computers, gave us fantastic wealth. What is the fourth wave? Well, I don't know. But we think it's a combination of biotechnology, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and telecommunications. So let's now talk about the fourth wave. First of all, there's Moore's Law. Moore's Law says the computer power doubles every 18 months. Today, if you get a birthday card in the mail, you open it up and there's a chip inside and it sings happy birthday to you. What do you do with that card? You throw it in the garbage. That chip has more computer power than all the allied forces of 1945. Hitler, Stalin, Eisenhower, Churchill, would have killed to get that chip in your birthday card. And what do you do? You throw it in the garbage. Your cell phone today has more computer power than all of NASA in 1969 when they put two men on the moon. This curve on a log chart shows that computers are gonna be a thousand times more powerful in 2020 than today. So we now know what the future of chips and computers are. Chips will cost one penny in 2020, according to Moore's Law. Chips will be everywhere and nowhere. Where is electricity today? Electricity is underneath our feet. Electricity is in the ceiling. Electricity in the, is in the walls. Electricity is invisible. It is everywhere and nowhere. And how do we pay for electricity? We meter it. Computers are next. The word electricity has pretty much disappeared from the English language. Nobody says electricity anymore. The same thing with computers. The future of computers is to disappear. The word computer will disappear from the English language. Chips will cost a penny, they'll be everywhere and nowhere, and we will meter it. How do we meter computer power? In the cloud. So you now know the future of the computer. And then after 2020, all this will collapse. Moore's Law cannot go on forever. We will enter the post-Silicon era. Silicon Valley could become a rust belt after 2020. I'll talk about that in a moment. So, let's talk about the future. Every decade, a new revolution in computers. The internet, a magic mirror. So where will the internet be in the future? In the coming years, the internet will be in your glasses. You will have full internet capability in your glasses. When you meet somebody, your glasses will recognize who they are. And as you look at somebody, their biography will appear next to their name. And if they speak to you in Chinese, you will see subtitles as you speak to somebody. You will always know who they are. 
you always know what they're talking about. So in the future, if you're looking for a job at a cocktail party, and you don't know who the important people are, in the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. <laughs> also, if you meet somebody today, you say, who is this person? I know him. Jim, John, Chick, I know this person. Who is this person? In the future, your glasses will say, it's Jim, stupid. <laughs> Remember? You met him last year at last year's event. Well, maybe you don't want to look like a refugee from Star Trek. In the future, they'll be fashionable. Children will buy these things. Children are the engine behind this. This image will be beamed to the retina of your eye. This is the future of email, the future of telecommunications. Fashion models will begin to wear these things. Everyone will have full internet capability. This is the future of your home entertainment center, the future of your home office. You'll have an office inside your glasses. Now you might say to yourself, wait a minute. I don't wear glasses. I don't like glasses. So what do we do for people who don't like glasses? We will put the entire internet in your contact lens. You will blink and you will go online. And who will buy these contact lenses? First, will be college students taking final examinations. <laughs> they will be the first to buy internet contact lenses. Who else will buy internet contact lenses? Actors, actresses, politicians. In a school play, you don't have to memorize your lines anymore. Everything appears in your contact lens. Who else will buy these things? Artists, architects, they will wave their hand and create beautiful works of art. And who else will buy these things? The military. The military is already perfecting internet contact lens. For the Science Channel, I flew down to Fort Benning, Georgia, and in front of the TV camera, I put on their version of the internet. It's called Land Warrior. You put on a helmet, there's a little visor, you flick it over, and immediately you see the internet of the battlefield. Enemy forces, friendly forces, tanks, airplanes, artillery, everything right inside your eyes. So the military is working on this. This is gonna be forever. Tourists will want this. If you're a tourist, visiting Rome, there's nothing left of the Roman Empire anymore. In the future, as you walk through the ruins of Rome, you will see Rome resurrected in your contact lens. And who else will buy this? Star Trek fans. Who here is a Star Trek fan? This is the holodeck. You will have the holodeck inside your contact lens, or the matrix. This will give you the matrix, worlds inside your contact lens. So this will revolutionize the way we interact with information. Information will be for free, it will be everywhere. You blink and you go online. The future is the matrix. So where have you seen this before? You've seen this before. This is called augmented reality, not virtual reality. Virtual reality is for games. Augmented reality is for people who are serious, who do it in their work, who study. This is augmented reality. And where have you seen this before? You've all seen augmented reality before. This is the former governor of California.
Look at the way the Terminator, Terminator robot sees things. The Terminator robot identifies objects, labels them, prints out the biography. This is how you will live in the future. Everything you look at, you will have descriptions of. When you're driving a car, in your contact lens will be the fuel gauge, how fast you're going, how much, how much electricity you have left. So this will be part of the way you live. You will live with the internet when you wake up in the morning. This is called augmented reality. You will also have 360 degree vision. The military takes this very seriously. If you are a pilot in a jet plane and the enemy goes underneath your jet plane, you're dead meat. You cannot see the enemy. But if you put a television camera underneath your airplane, shoot the image to your contact lens, you will have X-ray vision. This is also the future of X-ray vision. Your cars will have this. You'll be able to look around 360 degrees and see everywhere in your car with no blind spots. This is called supervision. Now, where else will the internet be? The internet will be everywhere and nowhere. These are your wristwatches. This is the internet in your wristwatch. This is the internet inside your, your cell phone. And if you have fat fingers, it is very difficult to type on your cell phone. So we will have flexible paper called OLED technology. These are plastic transistors. You simply scroll it out of your cell phone and you have a full TV screen and a keyboard in your cell phone. This is the future of paper. The future of paper is to become intelligent. And on the right hand side is the future of wallpaper. This is how you will decorate your wall in the future. Today, if you don't like the color of your wallpaper, what do you do? You suffer. In the future, you talk to the wallpaper and you say, change color, change shape. I don't like the way you look at the present time. On the upper left is the future of your wallet. Your wallet today has pictures that do nothing. They just sit there and do nothing. In the future, the pictures of your wallet will move. Why? Because chips cost a penny. And when chips cost a penny, Everything moves because everything is hooked up to the web. Also, this is the future of medical care. You will go to the wallpaper and you'll say, mirror, mirror on the wall. I want to talk to a doctor now. Immediately, an animated doctor will appear and you'll talk to it. And you'll talk about your pains and aches and ailments. And the doctor in your wall is a robot, is an animated robot called an expert system, and this will reduce the cost of medical care. You will always have a doctor in your wall. You will also have a lawyer in your wall. Most simple law questions will be answered by this lawyer in your wallpaper. This is your living room of the future. This is called the cave. 360 degree panels you'll be surrounded by 360 degree panels called the wave. And again, the military is perfecting this technology. This is also the future of your love life. Let's say it's Friday night and you have no date. What do you do? We all know what you do, you get stone drunk. In the future, you go to your wall and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's available tonight? <laughs> Your wallpaper knows who you like, contacts everybody who's also lonely looking for somebody, and will set up a date. And then you go on a date, you come back that night, and you say, mirror, mirror on the wall. 
my date and I want to see a movie like Casablanca. Except, remove Humphrey Bogart's face and put my face instead. <laughs> remove Ingrid Bergman's face and put my date's face instead. Chips will cost a penny in 10 years. Already, chips are being placed in toys. Toys are becoming intelligent. And this is creating a problem for the English language. We have a contradiction in terms called smart Barbie dolls. That's a contradiction in terms. Another contradiction in terms is Microsoft works. That is also a contradiction in terms. So the internet will be everywhere and nowhere. Now some people don't like this. Some people say that this is mechanical, it is forbidding, it is cold, it is unfeeling. Well, when the internet was created by physicists and mathematicians, it was male. It was about domination. It was about fighting a war with the Soviet Union. That's why we invented the internet, to fight a war. It was about domination. It was male. Now, the internet is female. 51% of the users of the internet are women, and they use it to touch people. The internet is female. It's about touching people, making contact with people. It's not cold, mechanical. It's about reaching out and touching people. And in the future, this is your television set. Three-dimensional television without glasses. Your TV will be three-dimensional without glasses. How? Your TV screen has vertical lines. Each vertical line is a prism, a prism which shoots two images, one to your left eye and one to your right eye. So in the future, your TV set will be three-dimensional with no glasses. And then your windows will be intelligent. Today, if your window looks out at a junkyard, it's pretty bad. Every day you wake up and you see a junkyard. In the future, you'll say, mirror, mirror on the wall. I want to see the Eiffel Tower. I want to see the Taj Mahal. And bingo, glass will be intelligent in the future. Why? Because chips cost a penny. Even glass, windows, will become intelligent. This is the office of the future. This is how you will work. Today, your desk is centered around your PC. But why? Your PC does nothing. It just sits there and does nothing. In the future, you will have scrap computers. These computers cost a penny. You scribble on them, and then you throw them away. And you move from room to room, and the scribble follows you. Your scribbling follows you in the cloud as you go from room to room, room to home, home to office, office back to home again. So in the future, chips cost a penny, computers you throw away, everything takes place in the cloud. This is your cubicle of the future. You will have plastic wraparound screens. Your cubicle will be so beautiful, you will never get any work done in the future. And this is how you will drive your car in the future. In the future, cars will communicate with the GPS system and they will drive themselves. Look at the left. That man is not on the steering wheel. This car has no driver. For BBC television, I drove this car. I was driving this car and then the cameraman said, let go. And I said, what? He said, let go. So I went like this, and I let go. Now tonight, I want you to do an experiment. Drive your car like this, OK? That's how we will drive the car in 10 years. Google, 
is putting millions of dollars to create the software for cars that you drive like this. These cars are safer than human cars. Humans get drunk, humans fall asleep, humans have road rage, computers, they could care less. They just drive by themselves. This is how you will shop in the future. You will have a credit card with your three-dimensional measurements on it, so everything will fit in the future. Today, if you go into a shop and there's this beautiful dress, $10,000 or a $10,000 suit, everything is perfect except it's the wrong size. What happens? Nothing. And of course, your husband or wife breathes a sigh of relief. No sale. In the future, you take out your credit card, you stick it in with your three-dimensional measurements, it punches out exactly a dress or a suit that fits your body. And then you will get the bill. In the future, everything will fit in the future. This is called mass customization. And what is it leading to? It, this is leading up to something called perfect capitalism. You will always know exactly what everything costs. Today your cell phone, using barcodes, can estimate the true cost of anything. In the future, your contact lens, when you walk into a store, your contact lens will tell you immediately how much does everything really cost. Supply and demand will be perfect in the future, and this is called perfect capitalism. Perfect capitalism means that you know exactly the real price of any object. Let me go, skip through this for a moment. Now let's talk about medicine. How will medicine look like in the future? Well, this movie, Fantastic Voyage, talked about putting a submarine in your blood. Now that's a joke. You cannot put a submarine in your blood. But in the future, we will put molecules in your blood that can kill cancer. This will revolutionize medicine. How small can you make a chip? We can make a chip today, so small, you could put it inside an aspirin. You could put a TV camera inside that aspirin pill and a magnet. You swallow it and the magnet guides this camera as it goes into your stomach and it goes into your large intestines and takes pictures. This gives new meaning for the expression Intel inside. <laughs> In the future, Intel will always be inside. And with nanotechnology, today, not tomorrow, today, we are making molecules that can destroy cancer cells. These are smart bombs against cancer. In the future, chemotherapy may be eliminated because we will have nanoparticles that can kill individual cancer cells. Today, we have nanoparticles that are about 90% effective against cancer. So in the future, cancer may be solved by using computers. And ladies and gentlemen, this could be the ultimate cure for cancer. Your toilet. Your toilet will be intelligent in the future. Your toilet, when you go to the toilet, your toilet will first of all tell you that you eat too much, too much sugar, too much salt, too much fat in your diet. Isn't the future wonderful? Even your toilet will tell you that you eat too much. But your toilet will also analyze proteins from cancer colonies 10 years before a tumor forms. This is the, perhaps the cure for cancer. The word tumor could disappear from the English language. These are called DNA chips. Transistor technology, so powerful, 
it can detect cancer cells before a tumor forms. Now, you know that Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computers, Steve Jobs today is probably dying of pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is almost always fatal. It kills you in a few years. It's very aggressive, very fast moving. Well, we sequenced pancreatic cancer a few months ago. And we found out that everything we knew about pancreatic cancer was wrong. Pancreatic cancer is not fast moving at all. We now know pancreatic cancer takes 20 years to form. 20 years to form pancreatic cancer. But you only feel it. You only feel bad in the last two or three years. And then it kills you like that. Everything we knew was wrong. In the future, your toilet will tell you, oh, by the way, you have cancer. <laughs> you have 20 years to do something about it. Maybe in the next decade, you should do something. Okay? You're going to have 20 years warning that you're going to have cancer. This is going to change everything. Compliments of Silicon Valley. Now, in Star Trek, they have the tricorder. You move this tricorder around, it analyzes your body, tells you what's happening. Science fiction, right? Wrong. We will have the tricorder. On the left is an MRI machine. Huge, gigantic. You know, when I was in high school years ago, I had an advisor at Varian Associates, Paul Ernst. He was my boss. He went on to win the Nobel Prize in Physics for the creation of the MRI machine. And how small can you make the MRI machine? The world's record for the smallest MRI machine is this big. We can now make an MRI machine this big. How small can you get it? To the size of a cell phone. This means that in the future, when you talk to the doctor, the doctor will be in your wallpaper. You'll talk to the robo-doc, and then the robo-doc says, I need an MRI scan. No problem. You take out your cell phone, and you go like this, you email it to your doctor, and your doctor will tell you what is inside your body, almost for free. This is going to revolutionize medical care in the world. And in the future, how will we control computers? We will control computers with the mind, just like an avatar. This is Star Trek, no, Star Wars. We have the Force. The Force allows you to project your thoughts. We have this power today, the power of the Force. This is a toy with the ability to read thoughts, beam thoughts into a machine, and carry out your wishes. We can read thoughts to a degree. Here's how you do it, either by electroencephalographs or by brain implants. This person here had a stroke, a massive stroke. He cannot talk, cannot walk, he's a vegetable. We put a chip in his brain, connected that chip to a laptop, and here he is. This person is paralyzed. A massive stroke. We put a chip in his brain, connected it to a laptop. He can now surf the web, do crossword puzzles, write emails, answer emails, anything you can do on a computer, he can do, and he is totally paralyzed. This is amazing. This is how we will communicate with computers in mid-century. By mid-century, we will simply think and access computers around us. This is the future. And what else can we control? Robots. This is Honda Corporation. Honda Corporation puts a helmet on a worker, connects the helmet to Asimo the robot, and Asimo the robot can now be controlled by a human. Where have you seen this before? In a movie called Surrogates with Bruce Willis, 
In that movie, Bruce Willis mentally controls a robot. This is a power that we have today in Japan. We can also even read minds to a degree. When you tell the truth on the left, that's what your brain looks like when you tell the truth. Nothing much happens. But when you tell a lie, first of all, you have to know the truth. Then you have to create the lie. And then you have to make sure that it is consistent with all the other lies you've been telling all these years. That's a lot of brain power. When you tell a lie, your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. So we can actually use this as a lie detector. And what else can we do? With the power of computers, we can read your genome for a thousand dollars. For a thousand dollars, we can read every single gene in your body. This is going to revolutionize medicine. And what will we do with this information? We will grow new parts of the body. This is an ear. The ear is made out of plastic. We put ear cells in it, which grow into the ear. Then the plastic dissolves, is biodegradable, leaving a perfect ear from your own cells. This is bone on the left, ears and noses on the right from your own cells. There's no rejection mechanism. This is a human bladder grown from a young girl's own cells without any rejection mechanism whatsoever. Now let's put on the video. And in the video, it talks about a visit to the doctor's office 50 years from now when we grow heart valves. We can grow heart valves today. So watch this video. I host it for the Discovery Channel. It talks about what a visit to the doctor's office will look like in 50 years. Let's have the video now. The video is called 2057. It's available on the web or through discovery.com. Quite ordinary, but that's deceptive. 
because woven inside the fabric are dozens of tiny computer chips and sensors monitoring his health. When he puts on his clothing, he goes online. Now get this, if he's ever knocked unconscious, his clothes will automatically identify his coordinates, alert the authorities, and upload his entire medical history before the ambulance arrives. In the future, you will have a doctor in your clothing. When you have a severe accident, brain cells can die within six minutes. The ambulance of tomorrow will not only reach you in time, it will carry a medical revolution that can save your life. Patient data registered, Alad Dega. Platinum class confirmed. Loss of blood, 35%. I suggest reversible death. Okay. After a severe accident or heart attack, every second brings us closer to death. So wouldn't it be great if one day we could somehow stop the clock? In the future, EMT crews could use a technique called reversible death or suspended animation. They will replace your blood with an ice cold saline solution, dropping your body temperature to below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. At that point, brain and heart activity come to a halt. And that's not the only blood substitute that one day could save your life. 50 years from now, we'll have cures for trauma victims that would seem like miracles today. Your left thigh has been fractured and your hip is dislocated. Two ribs and a second lumbar vertebra are also fractured, but you have a bigger problem. Your artificial heart has fissures. You're going to open me up? You need a new heart. The print's already in progress. It'll only take another 20 hours. Iris scan identified. Marie Balzac. Status. Cleared for security zone. Have a nice evening. In this high security area, gene specialists have processed the patient's tissue sample. Now, they are using it to print a heart. If your car gets banged up because you're in a car accident, what do you do? You go to the body shop and get a new door or fender. But if you happen to be in that same accident, you could die. Now, consider this. In the United States alone, there are 91,000 patients waiting for an organ transplant. And of them, 18 die every day for an organ that never comes. What we need is a human body shop. And in 50 years time, tissue engineering could change everything. A child today with a defective heart valve has limited options. Valves from animals don't last long, and artificial valves can cause clots. Steven Jakenhuvel wants to avoid these problems by implanting the world's first heart valve grown exclusively from the body's own tissue. Within an hour, he has the rough form of a heart valve, which he places in a bioreactor. Next, he adds nutrients and cells which normally line heart valve walls. The cells latch onto the structure and start to grow. Within just three weeks, a complete heart valve has formed. Finally, a pump exercises the valve to strengthen its walls so it can withstand the high pressures in a human heart. Patient Hakatha. During surgery, doctors won't have to touch the patient. Body temperature 46 degrees. Blood completely replaced with plasma solution. Instead, surgeons will manipulate a 3D model of the body. These virtual images will revolutionize surgery in the next decades. With a 
click, doctors can switch from a scalpel to a saw. They open the thorax virtually, while robotic arms perform the actual incisions. Are all the main arteries blocked? Yes, you can remove the organ. Okay, well, I'm running out of time, but my book, Physics of the Future, also talks about the job market, the economy, which nations will rise, which nations will fall in the future, who will have a job in the future, what jobs are doomed, which jobs are going to be obliterated, and which jobs will thrive, which jobs will dominate the future. All of it in my book, Physics of the Future. And now let me end on one last note. I spoke at the Einstein Centennial several years ago. And it was because of Einstein that we have many of the inventions of today. My favorite Einstein story is this. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him. And the chauffeur said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your talk so many times. I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache. I will put on hair, a wig, and I will be the great Einstein, and you can rest and be my chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. And this went on very well, until one day, a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. You've been a great audience, and we'll take a few questions. Thank you so much. Okay, are there any questions? Hello, it's a pleasure to, to meet you. Okay, I have a question. If everything is getting more intelligent, what's going to happen to us? Because uh, it seems that we are not longer needing um, doctors, we're not needing lawyers, so, and, and we're living more and more time with this uh, medicine advances. So what's going to happen to us? What's, uh, in, what are we going to spend the time? Just in pleasure? Just in having fun? I mean, what's, you show us the technical aspects, but what's about how we are going to evolve in, in, in human interactions? The question is, what are we going to do as the robots get more intelligent? Are we all going to take a rest and have a good time? Or Will the robots put us in zoos, make us dance behind bars as they throw peanuts at us when we're behind a zoo? What's going to happen? Well, realize today that robots, you saw Asimo in the video, I mean in the, in the slideshow. Asimo is the world's smartest robot. Asimo can walk, run, dance. He dances better than me. I've been on several BBC programs with Asimo. How smart is Asimo the robot? Asimo has the intelligence of a cockroach, a stupid cockroach, a lobotomized stupid cockroach. Our most advanced computers can barely walk across the room. So we have a long ways to go before they replace us. But eventually, who knows when that may happen. I've had a chance to interview some of the world's greatest scientists building robots at MIT, Stanford, and there are three ways we can deal with smart robots. One group of scientists I interviewed said that we should allow them to take over. They are our children. They are our evolutionary successor. They are the natural byproduct of evolution. 
They're smarter than us, stronger than us. So why not let our children take over is the natural scheme of things. Then another group of scientists I interviewed told me, quote, over my dead body are these tin cans gonna take over. I'm gonna get my shotgun if a robot becomes too smart. Their attitude is to take a chip and put the chip in the brain of a computer that will shut them off automatically if they have murderous thoughts. A chip in the brain to automatically shut down super intelligent computers. Then there's a third possibility. The third possibility is to merge with them. Why not wake up one day being Superman, having superpowers, X-ray vision, super intelligence, what's wrong with that? Living almost forever in a body that is enhanced genetically and robotically. So some people say, don't fear them, one day we should merge with them. But anyway, in my book, Physics of the Future, I list all the various possibilities of what's going to happen as robots become more intelligent. But it's not going to happen soon. Like I said before, if you're lucky, you will see a robot with the intelligence of a smart cockroach. That's not for a while. Any other questions? Here. Okay. My question goes, um, if the medical advances uh, enhance uh, people's lives, what will happen with, grow with population growth and what will happen with energy production? Okay, what happens when we live longer? What happens with energy to meet the needs of a growing population? Well, first of all, we are now discovering the genes that control the aging process. Today, we can double the lifespan of almost any animal. Take any animal, yeast, insects, spiders, worms, fruit flies, rabbits, dogs, cats, and now monkeys. We can double their lifespan. That's today, not tomorrow. And we're now discovering the genes that make it possible. There's a gene called SIR2, S-I-R-2, which governs that process, we think, of allowing us to double the lifespan of animals. So we're discovering the genes that, disco that control our aging process. In the future, the genome will only cost maybe $100 to sequence your genes on a CD-ROM. We will have millions, billions of CD-ROMs with your genes on it. We will take the genes of old people, take the genes of young people, and subtract. Therefore, we will find the genes that control the aging process. And we are 98.5% identical to a chimpanzee genetically. 98.5% identical to a chimpanzee. Yet. We live twice as long as a chimpanzee, meaning that a handful of genes have increased our intelligence and doubled our lifespan. We will find these genes very soon because there's only a handful of them. But what happens to the population? Well, I think that our grandchildren, when they, each the, when they reach the age of 30, they may decide to stop aging and simply live at 30 for several decades. This is something that we're looking at very carefully. Stopping the aging process, perhaps for our grandchildren. But what about the population? First of all, the population of Japan and Germany in the future is shrinking. It's actually collapsing. Last year in Japan, the death rate and the birth rate flipped for the first time in history. The Japanese population is contracting. Why? The birth rate is 1.2 children per family. Who's next? Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Italy. Italy is a Catholic country. Its birth rate is plunging. So as people become richer, more prosperous, they have fewer children. In fact, 
that's causing a problem in Europe because the populations are contracting. So as we live longer, the problem is not we're going to overpopulate the world. The problem is we're going to contract. People will have less children as they live longer and as they become more prosperous. Now, energy is a whole other question. Let me briefly summarize the situation with regards to energy. Gasoline, kilogram for kilogram, is more efficient, more power packed than solar, geothermal, hydrogen power. Gasoline is very efficient. Why? It is concentrated sunlight. Gasoline is concentrated sunlight since the time of the dinosaurs. Very hard to improve upon. But electric power, solar power, renewable power is dropping in price every year, while gasoline prices are slowly rising. I think in about 10 years, the two curves will cross. Not immediately, but market forces in about 10 years' time will make solar, renewable, geothermal power competitive with fossil fuels. And then in 20 years, fusion power, the power of the sun, becomes an option. The French, the Europeans, are investing $13 billion on the biggest fusion machine of all time, the ITER built in southern France. Fusion requires seawater. Seawater will be the engine of the future. So in other words, in the next 10 years, there'll be chaos. Chaos because oil, coal, solar will all compete with no clear winner. But in 10 years' time, solar could be competitive with fossil fuels. And in 20 years' time, fusion power could give us unlimited energy almost for free for the price of seawater. Okay, just one more question, and then we have to, I have to sign books and things. Uh, okay. One more question, yeah. ¿Qué tal? Buenas noches. Muchas felicidades, es un honor conocerlo. Y mi pregunta será, ¿qué opina usted acerca de resolver el problema de la energía, acerca de la energía geotérmica? He says it's an honor to meet you, and he asks for your opinion on resolving the problem of the energy crisis using geothermal energy. Geothermal energy is part of the mix, but not every country has geothermal power. Therefore, geothermal power cannot be the solution. For the next 10 years, I predict chaos. No one form of energy will dominate. There'll be a mix, a mix of different forms of energy. But we are running out of oil. We are about at the 50% point of oil. The peak oil is right about now. In other words, we have taken out about 50% of the Earth's oil. Roughly 50% of the Earth's oil has been taken out already. And then we're going to go downhill from now on. Which means that oil prices are going to be erratic. We will always have oil, but oil prices will rise as we go down the curve. So that's why I think that the next 10 years there'll be chaos, but after 10 years, I do think that solar power, because of tax credits, mass production, efficiencies, breakthroughs in science, will become competitive with fossil fuel technology, but not immediately. And then, like I mentioned, in 20 years' time, fusion power is an option. Fusion power has almost no nuclear waste. What is causing the problems at Fukushima, Japan today? It is nuclear waste. Nuclear waste is hot. Nuclear waste causes the meltdown. Why do we have three meltdowns in Japan right now? It's because waste, nuclear waste, is hot even after you shut down the reactor. That's why we have three nuclear meltdowns. Fusion plants do not melt down in the same way. And so I think that on a 20-year time frame, fusion power becomes an option. Okay? Okay, well, I have to end it now, so thank you so much, and I'll be...
uh, signing books and shaking hands afterwards. Thank you so much. Okay.